So, 11.32, I just start because most of this will be repetitive. Okay, it would be very nice, Piotr Kucharski, if you turn on your video and all the others, because I love to see the faces. Uh, okay, so this is the theorem which I proved most of, uh, of it last, uh, last time. Well, you cannot distinguish very well between these colors. Okay, so what we are given is, hello, hello. And what we are given is such a peacock mu t, which is increasing in convex order. And uh, this, is, this theorem is very important that it's in the one-dimensional case, so it's all R1. Otherwise, as I told you, it is widely terra incognita. Okay, and the idea is what we want to show is a martingale, which we denote by M, MT, between 0 and 1, uh, and this should have the distributions mu t, uh, the laws mu t, this is what I mean by mimicking. Okay, and we need some assumptions. Okay, as I told you, there is a very beautiful theorem by Lauther, and Lauther only needed that the support of these mu t's are convex sets. If not, you have little chance, as I told you, if you think of the Poisson process, of course, this has to jump. But there, the mu t's are, don't have a, a, a connected support. And once again, I want to, uh, I want to stress how, um, how impressive this theorem by Lauther is. So, for example, you can construct situations where the mu t, they are, all, uh, they are all supported by the rational numbers. So if it is supported by the rational numbers, then the support is all of R. So Lauther's condition is satisfied. But to have a continuous martingale, which is only on the, on the rationals, uh, is, is a challenging thing. OK. Uh, just to, just to point the, the importance. In our assumption 6.3, which I don't uh, recall, uh, this is all in the paper with Goody and with Matthias, who are both uh, watching. Uh, we have a stronger version of these Lauther assumptions, which is that the support, uh, that the mu t all have densities, and the densities are bounded away from zero uniformly on compact sets. This was our, uh, our uh, condition. Another condition which we imposed, but which is essentially without loss of generality, is that the L2 norm of the squared L2 norm of the martingales is uh, increasing linearly. This is just for convenience. And what I have shown you last time, was an important proposition on the way. So here is the proposition from last time. And this is proposition 6.5, which I have proved. So we have these mi, and I put t naught less than or equal t, less than or equal t naught plus h. <coughs> Uh, mu i, yeah, let's, let's write it like this, uh, uh, it's not very, very beautiful. So I take, as you remember from last time, what we do, we take finite partitions of, uh, so s is always a finite partition, 0 equals s naught less, less than s n, and this is 1, so we partition it, and then we have constructed a martingale mu st, 
the t between 0 and 1, mimicking mu s j. So we just partition it, and then it's a classical result uh, due to uh, Strassen that you uh, have, well, he has transition probabilities. We, what we want is we want to have nice martingales, and there, of course, our beloved friend is uh, the stretch brown motion, which you can take to interpolate between all these mu s j. This gives you martingales mu s t, and what we want to do is to pass to the limit. Okay, and the important insight was, well, you take such a bit of this martingale where it runs from t naught to t naught plus one. We think of it to belonging to this set S here. Okay, and if we have that here, the BMO norm, if we can uh, estimate it by some constant C times H times beta, and for some strictly positive beta, then it follows that m equals lim over the i m i <coughs> uh, of these martingales. We can pass to a limit, and this is, has continuous trajectories. So this is just repetition, what I have showed last time. And the nice thing is that the BMO norm, we have a BMO1 norm and a BMOQ norm. And the important thing for continuous martingales, and we can choose these to be continuous martingales, uh, we have that uh, all the BMO norms are equivalent. And therefore, it is the same condition that if we put here a Q and here a Q for any <coughs> there exists a Q less than infinity. This is the same condition. This we have discussed last time. Now, the proof of the theorem therefore splits in two parts. This is first, this proposition clarifies that we have to look at the BMO norm. And the next thing, which I will show you uh, in a moment, is that you get under our assumption 663 that we get indeed such, a, uh, such an estimate where for the beta we can take 1 over 4. So 1 over 4 is, is bad. It's not a good uh, uh, here exponent, but uh, the, this uh, Jon Nierenberg uh, result that all the BMQ, BMOQ norms are equivalent uh, shows that it doesn't matter for which beta and beta equal one fourth is perfectly, uh, perfectly feasible. So, what do I, this was just a repetition. Uh, what I will do today, I will show you the next proposition, which is the essential step to get such an estimate of the BMO norm, okay? And then in the remainder, then I stop here, you can uh, uh, find all the details in the paper with Goody and Matthias. And then I will show you something completely novel, where I hope it's true, I have not really double checked the proof, it was very, very recent. The big problem is what happens if we pass here to, or RD is uh, our space to higher dimensions. And I will show you at least an attempt under strong regularity conditions, much stronger than what we need in the one dimensional case and what Laufer uh, had to impose. Much, much stronger than this, but some, uh, uh, some, uh, positive uh, result where we want to show that we find in the limit a martingale which is as nicely behaved as, uh, as we want. 
So it should have continuous, it should be continuous, it should be strong Markov. Ideally, it should be an Ito diffusion, uh, which then implies all these properties, of course. Okay, and I will show you a sketch that under a very heavy condition, uh, replacing the assumption R63, R, uh, we get a positive result on RD. Once again, the proofs are not checked, and I will uh, tell you about very recent work in progress, uh, <coughs> which I investigate together with Goody since yesterday. Uh, okay, um, one more thing. This uh, proposition here is perfectly valid in RD. Last time I made a little question mark. We have checked this. Uh, the Jon Nirnberg holds also true for in the uh, RD valued case. And one more thing, we have also in the RD valued case, when we now take the mu t as measures on RD, uh, we of course can do the same mimicking of finitely many points by our beloved stretch brown emotion, because stretch brown emotion works in RD. And we get some uh, Ito diffusion process for this interpolation here. Okay, but first I want to show you how we do it for R1, how we complete at least a sketch of the proof of uh, theorem 6.4. So this is the Martingale here. Good, so what I, I'm, I'm still back in the one dimensional case. And I'm quoting from the paper with Goody and with Matthias. Okay, so I have here <coughs> uh, the proposition is the following. in the R1, one-dimensional case. So proposition 6.6 uh, .6 in our paper. So what do we have? We have these assumptions 6.3 on which I don't elaborate. And what we take is the first moment of the transition probabilities pi x s from T naught to T naught plus H. Okay, so what is this? This is the expectation of M S T naught plus H minus M S T naught in absolute value given uh, that uh, M S T naught is equal to x. Okay, so this is, and as I told you before, we have an estimate by h to the 1 over 4. So the first moment, the, the pi x are our transition probabilities of the mimicking martingale mst. Okay, and we think of T naught and T naught plus H to belong to this finite partition uh, S. And what we do, we have the transition probability. So the transition probability is the law of M S T naught plus H, given that M S T naught is equal to zero. And we want to, uh, estimate how much this moved away from the original position, which is x here, and we take the first moment, so the L1 norm of uh, this uh, difference here. Okay, so this thing here can be estimated with h uh, to the 1 over 4, 
And what is the, uh, what is the decisive thing? This is the following. <clears throat> we have, uh, so we have f of x. Uh, okay, we have this inequality here. So uh, <clears throat> we know that the, uh, if I take this thing here, I call this here f of x, okay, which is the first moment of this uh, thing here. So we have the first estimate is that uh, the integral of f of x d mu uh, t naught of x, that this here is less than one half h to the one half, where we keep in mind the, we don't mind very much if we have an exponent, we just want eventually end up with a positive exponent. Now why is this so? This is very cheap, follows from this normalization, because the first moment is less or equal than the second moment. And the second moment, this is just adding up the second moments, so the second moments of these transition probabilities, when you integrate over it, this is the, uh, the law of the mu t naught, when you integrate over it, uh, <coughs> of the second moment, it should, be, uh, it should be less or equal to h, and then to normalize the second moment, you have to take the square root, and you get just by estimating or by majorizing the first moment by the second moment, you get this uh, condition here. Okay, so this is one thing. The fx in total, when you integrate over it, the f of x uh, cannot be big, okay? But we need it for every x as we had it before. And now this is the, uh, the important thing is uh, f satisfies a Lipschitz condition. Okay, so this is our claim. Okay, so we claim that F satisfies a Lipschitz condition or F of X minus F of X plus K. So when you move away here, uh, this thing here is less than or equal to k. So it's Lipschitz with a with constant 2. Okay, now this is the decisive moment where we use the one-dimensional uh, situation and here I make a drawing. Uh, now here I make the, the drawing. So we have here, here we have an x, here we have time t naught, here we have time t naught plus h. Okay, and now the pi x here is a law how the uh, process, this is the process mst, how it moves starting from x, or here I have some x prime, okay, and here again there is some transition probability. Now I claim that when the x and the x prime are close, or have a distance k, then the first moment of these things uh, <clears throat> cannot be uh, uh, can be estimated. Now why is this so? Here is an important thing. When, you, when we have, when we have any, any level, and maybe I take a different color, fix here any y, and you look at the trajectories here, which go beyond y, okay? 
And here also you look at all the trajectories which go beyond y. Well, in my drawing, they are all beyond yeah, y. The claim is for each trajectory which starts from here to, uh, and ends up to the right of y, there corresponds a trajectory from here which also ends up to the right from y. So in other words, intuitively, these cannot cross the trajectories. Well, as I say, it is of course complete nonsense. Of course the trajectories can cross, but if you choose them carefully, you can make a pairing in such a way that they don't cross. So this is the idea of joining, which has been masterly applied. Well, it's an, I would almost say ancient idea, but in this context, uh, David Hobson applied it very well, but, but it's, it's, it's a technique known for, 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 for many decades. Uh, good, so call these, uh, these particles here, call them single or married, okay? Now, at the beginning, you let this particle start at x or x prime, and all of them are single, okay? And now, we let the particles move, and whenever a, a particle which is still a bachelor, okay, meets another particle from the other tribe, okay, then they marry, okay? Once they marry, they continue hand in hand, parallel, okay? Why? Because this thing is a Markov process, strong Markov process, which means when they have married here, then their law, law in the future is the same. So you can choose them in such a way that the married couples follow the same way. Okay, and the others are still uh, single, but the other singles, when they meet another single, then they marry. And now I think everybody sees the picture that when you do this procedure, you can never, two singles can never cross because whenever they, they, they cross, they get married and then uh, uh, they move together. So in other words, when you do this kind of joining, this kind of joining to every path which starts from here and uh, is below y, uh, uh, there is a path which goes here. Okay, from this, turning now to these first moments here, from this you get an estimate that the mass which is to the right from here from x prime away uh, dominates always the mass which on the right here. Okay, so it cannot move very much and if you do it in the other side, I think I gave you enough intuition that from this here you can see that the, uh, that the, the f really cannot, uh, it cannot change very much the, the first moment and the first moment satisfies this uh, uh, Lipschitz condition. Okay, so uh, by the way, thank you very much to all of, or to almost all of you, that you turn off the, the uh, uh, turn on the uh, your your videos. And Piotr Kucharski, I would ask you again, would be very kind if you switch on uh, the uh, the video. Okay, good. So, once we have this, now how do we conclude? How do we conclude uh, is we have on the one hand side, we know this f of x, we can control its integral and we can control uh, the, uh, the, this uh, Lipschitz norm here. Uh, okay, but from this it is clear that it cannot be very big at one single point, because if it would be on one point, if we, it would be big, then by Lipschitz, it would be big in, in, in the neighborhood of these points, and this gets in contradiction to this thing, and we get here an h, one over four. Okay, so this is, these were the essential steps in this baby Lauther theorem, as I called you, this theorem six four, and what I wanted to show you, this argument is very much one-dimensional. This joining works so wonderfully in one dimension. In two dimensions, there is nothing uh, 
which is analogous to this. Uh, but what you need is some kind of, uh, of Lipschitz or continuity or something of uh, the map x goes into these transition probabilities, pi x, which we adorn here for every s, t naught, t naught plus h. Okay, we want some continuity or Lipschitz or something. Okay, so now I turn to the case of Rd, which is our goal and which, as I told you, there is very little known about this case. Uh, good. Uh, the, uh, the, if we have some continuity or some control on this function, we should be able to mimic this proof here because, as I told you, the first proposition with the BMO does not depend on the dimension and here we have to replace something. One more remark, I did not speak about the strong Markov property here, which can also be shown and which we showed in, our, in this survey paper. Uh, but here again, the crucial thing is that you get some uniform continuity or some Lipschitz estimate on uh, this function here. Good, so let's start with the d-dimensional case. So, okay, so we start let mu t now be a peacock in Rd, okay, and I normalize it again, expectation of mu t plus h squared minus mu t squared is equal to h. So, okay, now this is much too difficult and is a favorite saying of Polya, which I really love and which I recommend to all of you. To every problem there is an easier problem. Okay, let's make it easier. Let's make it much easier. Okay. Now, let gamma epsilon be a standard Gaussian with on Rd with variance epsilon, okay? And we take the regularized mu t, mu t epsilon, I call mu t star gamma epsilon. So you convolve with a Gaussian, okay? To make it very, very nice. Okay, now more or less trivially, if the mu t are increasing in convex order, then also the mu t epsilon, these regularized mu t's are increasing in uh, convex order. Okay, and now we have the following. Uh, here is the theorem, hopefully true, okay, for epsilon greater zero, <coughs> there exists 
uh, Martingale diffusion mu epsilon t mimicking mu epsilon t okay and which is very nice very nice we have it's in fact it's a diffusion process d mu epsilon t is equal well i take this notation here sigma epsilon t of mu epsilon t <coughs> dwt okay i need another <coughs> Okay, now this dWt, this is a Brownian motion in Rd. Okay, these things here are d cross d positive definite matrices. And yeah, and uh, this diffusion should be understood in as an Ito differential equation. So in other words, this is to be interpreted as Ito integrals in with respect to this Brownian motion. And the sigma, uh, sigma of t and of x is, it takes values in the positive definite matrices, is measurable. And Lipschitz in X. Oh, hi, Piotr. Good to see you. Thank you for turning it on. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is so it's a measurable function. We have strong regularity in X, even Lipschitz, and you remember how important the uh, Lipschitz control in the variable x was in the one-dimensional case in a slightly different context. And, but with respect to t, we have only measurability. Uh, so there is no, but that this thing here makes perfect sense as an Ito integral in L2. Okay, so this is the theorem. And um, what do I have? Yeah. Okay. Now, next question would be uniqueness. We have not elaborated on this yet. And, and of course, there could be other regularizations here. You could, for example, you could take this thing here, but this is very much the same problem. So I, I stick to this situation here. Okay. So bottom line is an extremely strong regularization by convolving with a Gaussian for fixed epsilon, okay? Uh, but this gives you a positive, a first positive result, which is, uh, 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 yeah, which gives you a very regular so solution, in fact, namely even a diffusion process. Yeah, one thing, uh, maybe there are people here who are good in PDEs. I have a strong suspicion that uh, people uh, doing PDEs know this or something like this because after you can translate this into the language of PDEs this is the solution then of a heat equation with these coefficients of the heat equation. I, I don't know I'm not good in PDEs and but I would not be surprised if these people know this and, and know quite a bit more in fact. So I erase this again and we'll start by doing the construction. Okay, so, yeah, 
of course, whoever has good suggestions, so for example about results from PDEs, I, we shall be most happy to learn about these comments. Yeah, and of course I'm happy about any question. So, let's start the construction. We do the same thing which we did in the, uh, in the one-dimensional case. So again, we have our finite partitions, S0 to Sn. Okay, S is, this is the set of all these finite partitions, which is ordered by inclusion. And we have, of course, we have a D M S T is equal to sigma T. <coughs> Uh, and here I put an S of mu S T uh, D W T. Okay, so this is, as I told you before, if we have, uh, <coughs> okay, such that the law of M S at times S J is equal to mu s j. This we can have, for example, the stretch Brownian motion, which works so nicely in the d-dimensional case. Yeah, and Gudi and Matthias, I think this is, in this case, uh, stretch Brownian motion is the only construction which works in RD to give really a diffusion process, which is if we agree? Well, probably any, anyhow, it's, it's, it is good news and uh, if, we, if we can make uh, a good application of, uh, of stretch brown in motion. So here there is no, no epsilon yet. This is just the original one. Uh, good. And now uh, let gamma epsilon be uh, <coughs> uh, uh, be a random variable which is distributed according to this Gaussian law and independent of this construction up here of this Brownian motion uh, W. Okay, so this is here and now what we do is that the mu s epsilon t is simply mu s t plus gamma epsilon. Okay, so you have only one Gaussian random variable which we add to each of these mu s t's and very trivially we have law of mu uh, s epsilon at times sj is equal to the mu sj with the epsilon up here because we just added an independent Brownian motion, uh, uh, Gaussian random variable uh, which does the same thing as the convolution. Okay, <clears throat> now we have that this thing here it is a martingale with respect to <coughs> the sigma algebra, gamma epsilon. With the filtration, gamma epsilon t is sigma of m s epsilon t. Uh, and gamma epsilon. Okay, and which is the same as, no, uh, no, 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 the sigma of u, u less or equal to t, and this is the same as the sigma algebra of m s u, and 
gamma epsilon and here again the u less than or equal to t. So what do I mean by this? The <coughs> you can either take the natural filtration of mu s epsilon or the natural filtration of mu s but if you add the knowledge if you know what at the time zero intuitively at the time zero you reveal the value of gamma epsilon yeah then you can translate one into the other namely by simply where well, yeah if this is if this is fixed then the trajectories of this are just translates of the trajectories of this thing here okay and yeah it is a martingale well that's that's also uh, rather trivial it's highly non-Markovian uh, well it is it is Markovian uh, wait a moment it is Markovian when you uh, when you know the the gamma epsilon you have to add as a state space the knowledge of gamma epsilon but uh, in its own filtration uh, in this one without this uh, it is not Markovian. Anyhow this is a process okay now what we have it's not Markovian uh, <clears throat> yeah what we can do yeah what we can do we can write a, a, an Ito uh, uh, differential equation s epsilon t what is it it is equal to sigma s epsilon I write it like this mt uh, s epsilon and gamma epsilon dwt and which is equal to sigma t uh, here I have a t t uh, uh, s at the point mu s epsilon t minus gamma epsilon dwt yeah because the m s epsilon minus yeah <coughs> now what does this mean it, with writing this the coefficient here not only depends on the present position of the uh, of the process mu is epsilon but you also have to know the original gamma epsilon but if you know this then it is simply you remember if this is say little x then the trajectory is simply the shifted by x of the uh, that I'm, yeah of this thing here this is just equal to mu st okay so given the gamma epsilon it was our where, where did I have yeah it was this thing here uh, <coughs> and uh, so this is something okay good so this is true but we always have to add the knowledge of the gamma epsilon but what we do now is we calculate the transition probabilities as you recall this is the important thing and I will adorn here the s the epsilon and say the s uh, j minus 1 and s j okay <coughs> so this thing here okay uh, so what I have is sj minus 1 sj we have this process and this process has from every point x has some uh, transition probabilities okay now as I have motivated before we want to have uh, some uh, uh, some hand of this and in particular that we need a nice dependence on the x here okay now the first thing from this consideration this is just the average of the p x 
plus gamma epsilon of the S. Uh, this is a big S, SJ minus 1, SJ. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing is we have this. So here is the, uh, this is the MS epsilon which moves here. And we had here, <clears throat> we had at the beginning there was gamma epsilon. Okay, so that the gamma epsilon went from some, uh, call this thing here, y, from some y here to the x. Okay, this is governed by this, uh, uh, this Gaussian uh, law, uh, gamma epsilon. Okay, and now the x here, what, is, what are the trajectories? Well, you average over all these y's, here you have a y prime, where gamma epsilon moved it to x here, possibly. <coughs> so here is gamma epsilon of omega, uh, which is a random variable. And the original thing, if you think of, well, maybe I stop my drawings here. If you take the original without the epsilon transition probabilities, this thing here is just a mixture of these uh, transition probabilities. So. It's an average of the PY of S, SJ minus 1, SJ, where you average over the Y according to uh, a normal distribution uh, with center X here. Okay, so we have this thing. Yeah. Here's a question. Yeah. I wanted to ask, um, is the is this, pi, this what you wrote inside of the expectation yeah. where you integrate the kernel, right? That is, so this kernel pi f, f pi underscore x plus gamma epsilon, but is this well defined? This thing know? here? Yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, what I have, these things are irrelevant. We, we just take the expectation here over all values of gamma. Is this yeah, related is the, to a question? Is the kernel defined if so say the, the peacock mu is constant at the rock and zero. Yeah, the constant is uh, uh, p x. Okay, okay. So, so the, this is the original one. The case where the original peacock is just one constant. Okay, the original peacock is uh, no. We we have uh, no no. Wait a moment. We we have ah. Now I got it. Uh, this here is you have the, the, the mu epsilon uh, uh, x, uh, yeah, the mu, sorry, the mu epsilon t, they are all equivalent to Lebesgue measure. Why? Because the mu epsilon t are, where do I have them? Uh, I have erased it. They are convolutions with the Gaussians. Okay, and if you have any convolution with the Gaussian, it's, it's a very nice... Uh, the kernel you choose, right? The kernel you chose is, comes from a sketched brown emotion ah. with, with respect to the unregularized marginal. Ah, 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 uh, Okay, okay, this is, well, uh, there is no, thank you for the point, uh, uh, there is no loss of generality uh, in assuming that uh, the the mu uh, that the mu the original mu t is already oh. very nice because you can split the epsilon in two times epsilon over two so you first regularize it with epsilon over two then it has all nice properties and then you do the construction okay. yeah but but I just saw here so we have these transition probabilities. Uh, uh, but what we do is that we have to, uh, I hope that here that uh, you go back and forth does not make a, a difficulty. Okay, but in any case, these things here are known for each y. Okay, we agree on this now. So these are some 
transition probabilities and and we have this thing here okay so the the point is okay that yeah our that these things here are very nice mixtures of these transition probabilities and so for example what we can do now we can estimate the uh, uh, the second moments of these pi x Okay, so <clears throat> what do we have? Uh, we have that the uh, <clears throat> second moments of uh, the pi x. Uh, now we have s epsilon sj minus 1 sj. These things here, what are they? <coughs> they are equal to the, yeah, the squared second moment. I think it's clear what I mean. So this is the integral uh, over uh, the the distance squared from the from the mean x. So this is equal integral over R d m two two of <coughs> pi y s uh, s j minus one uh, s j. Okay, and d gamma epsilon x of y, okay, <coughs> and this can be estimated, okay, <coughs> why? Because we know that the, uh, that the, the, uh, hmm, does not look very good, uh, uh, that the integral over the second moments, uh, when you integrate with respect to our measure at time mu sj minus 1, that for this we had a bound and these uh, measures here are comparable on compact sets and, and uh, outside the compact set you can estimate. So I don't claim this was a complete proof, uh, but uh, we, can, we can control the second moment of the px in a kind of uniform way. But the most important thing is, and now I come to the heart of the matter, is we look at this x, goes over into pi x. And again, with all these things as above here. Okay? Now, what we wanted is some Lipschitz control, you remember. And this is, uh, I have, now this is the central claim is that the uh, total variation distance, that's the right thing here, of pi x, uh, what do we have here, pi x uh, to pi x prime, or it was the pi x plus k, <coughs> or make it here, x plus k as we had it before, uh, this is less than or equal some constant times k. Okay, so this is, you remember we had before with this Markov Lipschitz argument, with this joining argument, we had a, a Lipschitz control on this thing here. Now we again find the Lipschitz control uh, where this constant. Uh, yeah, the constant here depends only on the epsilon and nothing else, yeah. That's important. Uh, 
So I claim that this thing here holds true. Now what is the total variation norm? The total variation norm of two measures is the mass which is out here. Uh, <clears throat> so total variation norm, this is equal to 1 minus uh, pi x uh, uh, wedge pi x plus k. We always have these things up here and uh, this thing, the L1 norm. Okay, so you can estimate this here by calculating what is in the joint measure here uh, and <clears throat> you, uh, what you get is here, uh, yeah, the, the, the mass in, in this area here uh, is equal to 1 minus the mass up to a factor 2 or something, uh, 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 okay, of this thing here. This is the total variation norm and this comes easily from this formula here. Where do we have the formula? We have that the, I write it again, Px, now always with all this uh, adornment up here, <coughs> with the epsilon, but this is with the epsilon, okay, is equal to an, uh, the expectation, we had it here, of the, uh, uh, of the pi x with these things without the epsilon and plus gamma epsilon. Okay. Now this is, this is our basic formula, well I erased these sketches, that the transition probability uh, under the epsilon is just a mixture of these transition probabilities where I, uh, I vary the starting point. Okay, now this is a pi of x plus gamma epsilon. Now if you have x and if you have the same thing for pi x plus k. You have the x plus k plus gamma epsilon. So you have two Gaussians here. <coughs> so this is the law of x plus gamma epsilon and this is the law of x plus k plus gamma epsilon. Now Contrary to this picture, when the x and x plus k are close, then most of this thing here is, uh, is in, the, uh, in the intersection and this goes linearly with k, uh, goes to 1, okay? And we have for the rest, uh, <coughs> the difference is therefore it's an integral over these things here of the pi x. Uh, yeah, we had, yeah, here we have an estimate of the pi x epsilon. We have, we have an, uh, an, here we have the pi x without the epsilon, but we have a control of this in the integral over the, uh, the L2 norms of this, uh, of this pi x. And now, the difference of these things, these are very nice uh, uh, functions and therefore we can eventually, we can estimate that, ah, ah yeah, and I should say, well, if, you, if we take some point here, some y, uh, or let's, let's make it a little bit here, then we know for these things here, we choose in our mixture here, we choose the same py and for these things here a different one is taken depending on whether we are calculating pi x or pi x plus k and the difference of these two things is a mixture of these things where the mixture is just uh, given by 
the integrals over these two remaining parts. So this was a hint why we should find, for the total variation, we should find a Lipschitz con uh, control here. Okay, okay. Now this is very good, as you have seen before, that uh, uh, this was the crucial thing that some kind of Lipschitz estimate we, we get. And what is convenient here is the total variation norm. Okay, now let's try to pass to the limit. Of course, our aim is to let s go uh, to infinity or to go along this filter. And here I have a special present for Matthias that who spent quite a bit of his life on ultra filters on N. And so we take you, make you an ultra filter. Ultra filter uh, <coughs> on uh, ultra filter on this set S, which is the collection of all the S equal S0 to Sn. Okay, so we want, of course, on this set S, we want to go to limits, and it's very convenient if you know this notion, an ultra filter. When you start with an ultra filter, everything by definition, which varies in a compact set, converges already, and you don't have to extract subsequences of subsequences, etc. Okay, but this is mainly cosmetic. Okay, now what do we do? What do we do? Uh, we take, we fix an S naught, say S naught one to S naught n. Okay, <coughs> and we take the S bigger than the S naught, so a refinement, and we calculate the pi uh, x. Okay, uh, now the x, the epsilon, and we take s not j to s not k. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's now a different k, but little matters. Uh, and, oh, sorry, here is an s, and here we put x. Okay, so, uh, the point is here we have here we have a, an element j and the k is bigger uh, uh, and not necessarily subsequent. This is what I do here, and in particular when we pass now to an s, it still refines these steps. Okay, <clears throat> but what do we have? We have that the p x. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the, the uh, total variation, uh, total variation of p x uh, as uh, uh, of all these things. The well, let's write it s epsilon s j null s j s k zero minus pi x prime. Now I write x prime for s epsilon s j zero, s k zero, <coughs> okay? And the distance in total variation norm between these two things here. Uh, well, uh, this is independent uh, of the, uh, ah, yeah, it still goes with the, uh, yeah, well, I, I can fix here these two things. I don't need a, a control over the, the uh, uh, distance of these two things. But this thing here is less than or equal 
2x minus x prime, okay, where the constant here times a constant which depends on the epsilon. Yeah, but otherwise it's uniform here. Well, if they are close, uh, it only gets better. But this, this works for any uh, such things. Okay, now, okay, we may pass to the limit s uh, goes to infinity. I write it like this, or s along this ultra filter goes to infinity. Well, where well, this has to be understood uh, in the sense of ultra filters. What do we have? I claim that the pi x, now again s uh, with all these things here, with the s here converge to a pi x which does not depend on the s anymore, s yield zero, s k zero. <coughs> Why do we have this? Well, we have Let's first take 1x, okay? So we have had a control on the second moments of these things here. So now by Prokhorov, we have that for fixed f, for fixed x, <coughs> there is convergence. Okay. <coughs> But now I need that for the other x, uh, x prime there is also convergence and that it converges to something nice. But the nice thing is our uniform Lipschitz control on the total variation distance of these two creatures here. So for the total variation uh, is still when you pass there is convergence, yeah I should say with respect to weak convergence of measures by Prokhorov. Okay, <clears throat> so we have this for every x, but what we have is that the total variation norm, this is semi continuous in the right direction with respect to the weak convergence of measures. Why? If we have a uh, uh, a sequence P, I write it X S and P X prime S and I have a uniform control how much there is in the, in the intersection which is close to one contrary to this picture and now these things here they converge to a measure Pi X and Pi X prime in the weak topology Okay, then you see when these things here converge, now also this intersection here converges, <clears throat> and the only thing which may happen is that you have even uh, th these things here converge to something which has a, an even bigger uh, uh, overlap, but in the limit you get the inequality for the semi-continuity in the right direction, and which means that this thing here passes over to the limit. Okay, so this we have for every uh, uh, for every x and for every now you have these things here now call them t naught and t naught plus h to have the same. This we have now for every pair of points. We have these transition prob uh, probabilities. So it is important to note here, we started with the process. This process M, yeah, I have not written it. This only gave us the transition probabilities and I was now only speaking about the transition probabilities. Okay, and now you make with this transition probabilities, you make new processes, namely by pasting the transition probabilities together, you have to verify that they are consistent, which means 
when you go from T0 to T0 plus H, but you go over other uh, stations, that in this case uh, you have that the uh, transition probabilities uh, do the, yeah, that's called the, uh, what's it called, the uh, Kolmogorov, uh, Chapman Kolmogorov equations. You get how to, how to convolve these things. Uh, with these uh, probabilities and uh, what you get, you get in the limit, in the limit, you get a martingale in with in the score hold space 0, 1. So a priori, this is our usual compactness argument with respect to finite uh, uh, convergence, but now we have to show that uh, the that this is not only a martingale in this uh, space uh, of in, in this Korolev space, but that it is Markov continuous and even a, uh, a, 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 a diffusion process, and that we. Uh, that we get the, uh, the, the, the right diffusion process. How do we get now the diffusion coefficient? So what we are still out for, we have to construct the sigma epsilon t of x. Then we are finished. For this, we, we have all the transition probabilities. And we have a nice control. These are, uh, we have this Lipschitz control on, on their uh, distance in total variation norm. Yeah, but how do we, how do we proceed? Okay, the limit, the limiting martingale we call mt. And I should put an epsilon, yeah. Okay. Now we have that we can consider the, well, a priori it's this bracket process. M epsilon t is the total variation process. Okay, how do we get? We get the total variation process of this, uh, uh, of this martingale here. Well, we get it simply from all these uh, uh, transition probabilities, you just have to take the dyadics or something refining. You, you take the, this process at all uh, on finitely many points, you refine, you always calculate the, uh, the uh, quadratic variation process and we know this converges. In general it can have uh, jumps uh, uh, and need not be continuous. But we have this thing here. Now the mu epsilon t, the mu epsilon t gives you exactly the, uh, the uh, uh, transition probabilities because, or the L2 norms of the transition probabilities, uh, because we have that uh, the uh, integrating over uh, the, the um, quadratic variation process is the same as the second moments of uh, these pi x here. We have a control on the second moments. This is what I have shown you before and therefore you can now with, with all these heavy controls here you can show that the, uh, the uh, total variation process is not only continuous but it is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure and then it's a kind of rather Nicodem theorem uh, that uh, from the or from from the total variation process uh, which is the total variation process here takes values in the positive definite matrices uh, and is an increasing process in the positive definite matrices uh, that uh, uh, from this here with these estimates you show that this behaves nicely and that you have a 
mu epsilon t over dt that this here exists and this gives you exactly the diffusion coefficients. Well, I don't claim that this was a very formal proof what I gave you, but uh, I'm quite excited about these things and I wanted to share the ideas. I will come back to this next week where we have our last lecture and there is a non-negligible probability that I will have to confess next week. Oops, there was a serious flaw in the argument, but we shall see and I hope we, uh, we continue to make some progress. Okay, so this is all for the moment. Questions, remarks? If this is not the case, or is it the case? No. Well, really, I mean, what do you think is the likelihood that this Kellerian result is true without any regularity assumptions on the margin? Ah, uh, no way. No, no, uh, you, well, at least it is far beyond uh, my abilities. Uh, this is... It's uh, probably the only can do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, I mean, this is much too difficult because, uh, yeah, we, I, I can show you maybe next time some, some counter examples where you see what, what goes in R2 very differently from what, uh, what goes on in R1 and, and discuss this. But uh, what is possible uh, is, well, to play around and to weaken this very strong condition and to see which, uh, what, what, what we can do. We can, yeah, as, as I told you before, Matthias, what is nice here, we have a solution for any epsilon, which is really now a martingale and not, not just a martingale, which, which mimics all the mu t and not just finitely many. And now, of course, the natural reflex is let the epsilon go to zero. And under which condition can we, can we pass to a limit uh, when epsilon goes to zero, but I'm not, uh, I think we need very, very heavy assumptions to, to arrive at something, at something reasonable. But of course, all this is open and I'm most happy to discuss it with everybody. And let's see, let's see what comes out, yeah. Yeah, one thing, as I mentioned in the beginning, uniqueness is, a, a, is something which, yeah, which is the obvious, obvious thing one has, to, one has to verify. And what is very important to uh, ask knowledgeable people in PDEs that maybe they say, well, this is obvious uh, that, you, that you get such uh, coefficients in the, uh, for the heat equation uh, when, when the mu t's have, have nice regularity uh, properties. Okay, so see you again next Tuesday. Thank you.